you have worked at both facilities only for a short time here. What's your what's your take on this idyllic surrounding? As soon as they arrived here, they just were calm, and they've been calm ever since. Um, it's been an amazing experience to transition here. They loaded beautifully. They all unloaded beautifully. We actually had to unload them up at the top from the road there, and they walked down and. And thanks to Newton, he was practicing getting them in. He was very nervous, I think, that it was going to be a long process. But as soon as one went in, the rest just followed. So they've sort of become a herd in their own. Um, but I think it's, it's only going to bring positive things for us. And as you can see, this farm is actually more active with people as well. So I think that's only going to help in, in the rehoming process of, of the horses. Because in f the farm we were at in Philippi, just no one from outside came. It was just sort of us and people who were interested in coming to see whereas here you have other trainers coming riding instructors kids and people and so it's just going to be I think a positive experience for us. I was in the process of being retrenched and I went down to the SPCA in Grassy Park um, to their horse care unit. I've been working with horses since I was five years old with thoroughbred since I was 10 and I've been hooked ever since. My very first introduction as a child was a horrible little pony that I fell off a lot and uh, very fortunately my stepdad had thoroughbreds and so by the age of 10 I got my first thoroughbred and been with thoroughbreds ever since. The association over here with these horses, it must be quite hard in a way when they're actually sufficiently grounded to have to say goodbye to them. I used to be in tears each time specifically at the SPCA because we dealt with everything there from little ponies to confiscated and abused cart horses to everything in between and the Equine Trust had some horses there as well and I got very very tearful. I used to have to sit in my car before I went home and say leave it inside this gate. Um, as it's progressed and I've been with them nearly nine years now, um, I get a lump in my throat yeah. but I do a lot of the inspections as well. Newton and I do all the property and home ins horse inspections. So I know where the horse is going. And in fact, I'm, when I leave you here today, I'm going to do an inspection out in Solari's Pass. So I know where the horses are going and I feel okay about it. The crowd that are here today are just absolutely amazing. Horses come first. Uh, I don't know if you know that Newton drives all the way from Fishhook every single day. Um, he's just absolutely amazing. And these girls have got full-time jobs and they still managed to find time to come out here and help. Yeah, I've been wanting to do what Newton does and what the Western Cape Equine Trust does since I was seven or eight. I mean, I've been in love with horses ever since I was four, so I've, it's been my dream to rescue racehorses off the track and just give them a good home. That's my, that's my real focus. And working with Newton has been like finding a pot of gold because he's so knowledgeable on what he does and he's so his natural way and the outcome of what he brings is just, it's breathtaking for me. And yeah, I'm very proud to be in the family. You know, they say with uh, martial arts and judo that, um, that gentle is sturdy. Yeah. And your particular passion is dressage riding and, and that is the, the fundamental of discipline for horses. Yeah. yeah. No, you're right. Um, when you start training young horses or any old horses that have and you're trying to re-school re them, basically. You need to always lay that lateral work first before you do anything else, which is dressage, you know? And that gives you discipline, it gives you understanding, it gives you trust. You become one with the horse, and the feeling of that is just wow. Well, basically, I come from Botswana. And I ridden my whole life and when I came here I looked for somewhere to volunteer because I wanted to start working with horses again. And then I found Newton and I came for a day and I just realized that you can ride your whole life but this sort of thing is a completely different world, working with them on the ground and getting them from the track and how they change in the process of just working with them calmly and all of that. So that's how I got in. And I loved it from the moment I got here, and I've stayed ever since. <laughs> now, apparently you got a horse that um, was wild and unmanageable and dangerous. Yeah, so I had volunteered here for about two months, and she was at the trust, and she was a difficult horse to work with. Um, not a lot of people enjoyed working with her, um, but we sort of just clicked, and 
I started working with her every week and she I could tell she was an amazing horse the type of horse that follows you around but if you didn't know what you were doing with her she would challenge you um, but we built up a good relationship I just wasn't in the position to take her so she was rehomed and they had her for six months I think and they had trouble with her and Newton had gone to go and help them a few times and then I went to go visit her and two weeks later they said she was unmanageable she was dangerous they couldn't work with her um, they want to put her down um, so Newton and I organized to take her back and she came back with a lot more problems than when she left and I started working with her again and she's the most incredible horse and Newton really teaches us how to work with them and how to calm them and how to have a relationship with them and not just see them as something that works for you, something you work with and you get to know their nature and taking the patience to work with her and figure her out, for, figure her out is she's the most incredible gentle horse and we have a great bond now. And I believe she's not particularly small either. No, she's 17 hands. <laughs> Newton, from the last time we spoke, it may geographically be a lot further for you to come, but I'm sure the fact that you're out here, both for yourself and for the horses, is a very, very big shot in the arm for the Western Cape Equine Trust. Yeah, um, as you said, it's a bit further for me, but if you have to take a consensus from the horses, I guess they'll all vote yes. It's really lovely here, they've got nice open paddocks, they've got a bit of green grass which they didn't have before and they're getting their three meals a day and they've got nice stables so I don't think they can want for more. From our point of view we've got nice working arenas and the uh, double ring which the people put up for us which we're thankful for and um, yeah so it's, it's working well. Obviously the, uh, the, the funding of the whole operation, it's an ongoing thing, there's always a dire necessity for, for funding of an operation of the sort. Yeah, absolutely, and we don't get any other funding than what we raise ourselves, so we do our fundraisers, um, two of them a year. Um, one was at uh, over just before Christmas, where we have a race day at Kenilworth, which went very well, we raised good money there. And of course this horse is for causes, which Ken's really taken on board and has done extremely well out of it, thank heavens. I think the auction of stallion services is something that uh, is very, very important to proliferate this breed. But horses are funny things, it doesn't matter how well they're bred. It's more a case of environment and treatment that makes them into unmanageable creatures that, uh, that don't really have much viability in a second market. Yeah, I think that uh, it, it makes a huge difference who trains them, really. Um, I mean, we, d we get horses from many different trainers, and um, it certainly shows. Um, as, as top trainers or top trainers, there's a reason for that. And uh, the way they work with their horses is really amazing. And we've just got to try and change the mindset when they come to us from racing to other disciplines. And that's where we come in, so that we try to end up with a horse that's neutral, if we can call it that. So from there you go ahead and train whichever way you want to go, but it does all the things it should do, specifically have good manners. Now this model, um, is it something that you have formulated through years of experience or is it something that, that is ongoing? How, how does it work? Okay, the model that I'm using, um, for want of a better way I suppose, has been developed over a period of time because it's successful. Insofar as we start um, right from where it goes, so the horse has never been ridden, we start from there and we teach its ground manners so that it stands when you have to get on it, stands when you have to settle it. Sounds silly, but racehorses don't normally do that type of thing. So we start from there and then we work with the halter from the time we got them. And we work it right through. So the commands we use on the ground, we use when we put the saddle on. We don't have a person on, we do the same commands. And um, we do a lot of ground work. And then when the person gets on, then the horse is already used to being worked the way it is, so it's just another weight on the back. And we work the horse like that for a bit, and then we hand over the commands to the rider, and at the end of the day we end up with a horse that can walk, trot, canter, and stop on a halter. Not because it's in its mouth, but because it wants to do what you're asking it to do. And that's really the, what we try and achieve. A dire necessity to change from a safety perspective, and also because the gentleman that owned the previous property had decided that he no longer wanted to deliver, is that, is that more or less the gist of it? 
Yeah, in fact, that was where it got to. You know, we went there and we did livery right from the word go. And now he's had the, mar had the property on the market for a couple of years and it's taking time to sell. And he decided that he didn't want to have the, what can you say, the the number of grooms that he had and to do the work that he was doing. So he said to us, look, either we do it ourselves, employ our own people, which will lend, re rent us stables and facilities, but um, we would have to do it ourselves. And that wasn't in our framework. We don't employ people, uh, basically all the people that we have are volunteers. And um, and to run a stable yard, I mean, I've done it, uh, and, and you probably have as well, and it's, it's quite an onerous thing. And you tend to spend your life doing the stuff around the horses instead of getting around to training them. And that's really what we want to do. We want to retrain horses and find homes for them. That's our mission, rather than running a stable yard, if you can get the difference. Yeah, I think you've just highlighted a very important point because I often find that um, a lot of energy is taken up uh, diffusing labour issues and where people are working for a job. They're not working for the love of the horse. Yeah, absolutely. Then you have to be there when they fed morning and night. You have to be there seven days a week. I mean, you've done it, I've done it, I know. Although you've got good staff, you have to be there because if the staff isn't there, someone else is going to clean those stables, put those horses out, clean them, feed them and bring them back in again. And that someone's going to be you. And, and, and that's we really losing our, what, we want, what we want to try and achieve. And so there was really no alternative for us in terms of staying there. So it was just a matter of finding somewhere. And, and in Cape Town today, you want to find somewhere where there's water. And the wonderful thing about this place is it's got its own fountains. So there's no control on that. It, it runs into the dams. Dams are full, as you see in the background. And everything's green. It's just, it's just lovely. Well, Diane, first of all, having had the privilege and opportunity to go out to the farm this morning and see the beauty of the surrounds that some of these racehorses get to retire in, which is not the case with every one of them, uh, I felt very gratified that something constructive is being done and that's part and parcel of the organisation in which you're involved in. Absolutely. I'm representing Godolphin, which is, as you know, a global international stable, on the committee of IFAR, which stands for the International Forum for the Aftercare of Resources. It, it runs very much off your tongue like that. IFAR um, it was conceived in July 2016 in Newmarket by the heads of racing from some of the major racing countries in the world. From the UK, we had the, the head of the BHA and the Jockey Club, and likewise from America, Jim Gagliano is the president of the Jockey Club. From Australia, we had representation of the chair of Racing Australia. And um, also from the, from, the, from the BHA in the UK, ROR is their retraining of racehorses program. The reason for this concept was to show, was, was basically for the racing world to step up and explain to the world that the aftercare of thoroughbreds is very much part of the fabric of the racing industry. It's part of the business of racing. We breed horses, we race horses, and it's our obligation to make sure that their retirement or secondary careers, they've got so much more to offer. His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum is a lover of horses. He's a passionate um, horse thoroughbred owner and breeder, and he feels part of his responsibility is to ensure that not just the horses that he can retain and wants to retain himself, like Prince Bishop, African Story, Papino, all Group 1 winners who didn't have a career waiting for them at start, but because of them and other horses like them, we've been able to create our own Godolphin Lifetime Care program, which is basically how we look after and incorporate those horses into the, their, their, their aftercare, into another life for them that is, as, I can't say, just as important as winning Group 1 races, but they lead the yearlings. We, we have, obviously we look after our mares, our, our stallions when they retire. That's wonderful. Sheikh Mohammed... Can look after, does a very good, wonderful job through Godolphin of looking after our own horses. But his concern is for those horses that we breed, that we sell on, they might race for us, but they go through horses and training sales. What happens to them in whichever corner of the industry they end up in around the world? So thanks to, um, to IFAR now, hopefully we have a forum in place where people can really come online, they can meet, they can network and talk about the best opportunities they can create for their own horses. 
I'm so privileged to be here in, S in South Africa to be at Kenilworth today. And I too have a, have a racehorse in training, it's a bit small one, but I now hope that there's somewhere that I can actually contact because I know that the racing industry in South Africa is doing the exact same thing as we're trying to create worldwide. Well, I could talk to you forever, but I'm just going to ask you one final question. Please, whatever happens in IFA, if we can be kept in the loop and the authorities in South Africa can make it the responsibility from this fall of hammer to the people who buy racehorses that it is God's most beautiful creature and it needs to be nurtured. Very much so indeed. And as such, uh, Mr. Lyndon Behrens is coming to the Asian Racing Conference this year in Seoul, in South Korea, um, in May, to very much talk about what is happening in, in, in South Africa. And there he will meet lots of like-minded people as well. It must be very heartwarming for you that you found this wonderful property out near Stellenbosch Eichenhoff Farm and people of the caliber of a guy called Newton Phillips. We are very fortunate to have someone like Newton uh, running our operation and uh, very pleased that we've made the move. You know, uh, we've been in Philippi for a long time. Uh, things, there have been some issues and problems in Philippi and uh, so we knew we had to move and the owner of our property was selling so uh, we had to find another place and the committee members did some research and eventually came up with this place out in Eichendahl. Uh, and it's beautiful. As you know, you were there this morning. Uh, it's own spring water, paddocks, oak trees, green grass, uh, lakes. I mean, it couldn't be better for the horses. It just so happens that, that you've got two horses that are particularly well behaved as a result of work that has been done on them because the last thing you want is for a horse that you've had in your care for so many years to end up in the wrong ownership with the wrong set of skills, which clearly is not going to be the case. No, absolutely. You know, I think uh, as an industry, as owners, we've got responsibility to the horses that have done us so proud on the track. I've got two horses uh, there at the moment. One is Cigar Boy, who was one of my all-time favourites. And then a horse called Amadeus Rocks, which we actually bought in Australia at the English Melbourne sales. And he's come a long way um, and he's furnished down into the most magnificent uh, animal. And uh, I believe he's doing very well at his chance for a second career. Uh, and we're just hopeful that we can rehome him to someone who's going to love him as much as we did. On the subject of money, we all know that the biggest problem in life is water. And the second biggest problem is money. Now, to run an operation like this costs a lot of money. People volunteer their services, but horses have got to eat. Horses have got to have veterinary care. And that's what this day is about. And that's what the Southern Cross Day is about. You're involved in raising money for this initiative. Absolutely, and you know this is um, this is what we rely on: is charity and the good heart heartedness of, of of donors and people who are passionate about horses and who really care. Um, but it does raise the question: should we be in this position? Um, and this is, I think, what Di was trying to put across. And it's something that we're looking at, and uh, Lyndon Barnes from the NHA is, is, is looking very closely at and communicating internationally. I heard Di mention to you in an interview that we're now part of the global industry. And there's this move right across industry, uh, which is saying basically that racehorses are the responsibility of that industry. Um, and, and I firmly believe that we need to seek alternate methods of funding so that at least we can guarantee a horse's future once he's finished racing. Uh, it's happened in Australia. Uh, to a certain extent, their hands were forced because of bad publicity and the possibility that racing could even be stopped there if they didn't attend to the problem. And I believe it's, it's, it's a direction that we have to investigate very carefully um, because it's, it's, it's not very easy to come up with a model that's going to get a buy-in from everybody, everybody in the industry, but I believe that it's the only way to go for the future. We cannot continue just um, expecting people to donate money and, and for charity to look after X racehorses. So to put the lid on it, when a person digs into his pocket with his hard-earned cash to buy a horse, he or she should have an intimate understanding that this is not just the racing career of the horse that you are purchasing. You're buying something that will stay with you for the rest of your life if indeed there is no fund to provide for him when you no longer have a feasible use for him. Well, do you know the life of a horse can be anything up to 30 years old? Um, and, and, and a horse's career might end due to injury or perhaps he hasn't got ability or he's not suitable for racing for whatever reason, temperament. Uh, he, he could end his racing career as a two-year-old, as a three-year-old, as a four-year-old, as a five-year-old. What happens then? What do we do with the animal? Um, someone has to take care of that animal. Thank you.
when I see a horse happy in his new home, wherever that may be, whatever that horse is doing, and I've got a happy owner. That's a success to me.